This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. My next guest starred as Sergeant Isabel Lacoste in the Prime Video series Three Pines. She is an accomplished award-winning filmmaker and actor, a member of the Kenai First Nation Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as Sami from Norway. She co-wrote and co-directed the narrative feature The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open with Kathleen Hepburn, which premiered at the 2019 Berlinale Festival and received the Toronto Film Critics Association for the Best Canadian Film and was also nominated for six Canadian Screen Awards for which she and Hepburn received the awards for Best Direction and Best Original Screenplay. Her feature full-length documentary, The Meaning of Empathy, won the 2022 Canadian Screen Award for the Best Feature Feature-Length Documentary. She also took home the 2022 Canada Screen Award for Best Lead Performance by an Actress for her role in Danny Goulet's Night Raiders. Most recently, she directed three episodes of the new Crave Limited series, Little Bird, and she is now here with me to join me in a conversation on Stop Time. It's with great pleasure that I introduce you all to Elamaya Tailfeathers. Welcome. Are you in Vancouver? No, I'm at home on the Blood Reserve in, oh, wow. in Alberta. Yeah, I was uh, I was in New York with my ex husband when the pandemic hit as well, and uh, yeah, and then left uh, and came back to Vancouver, um, and then my marriage ended and I came home to the reserve. So I, I live here at home on the reserve at my mom's house. So currently in my mom's basement. <laughs> No, that's so interesting to me. Talk to me about that. So many of us have made transitions after the pandemic. Do you feel comfortable talking about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, to a certain extent, definitely. Um, It's been, my life has changed in such drastic ways. Like I think everybody's has um, throughout this pandemic, you know, I think uh, as someone who grew up with a fair amount of trauma, like my childhood was very chaotic and a little bit turbulent. Um, Intergenerational trauma is a very real thing. (laughs) I love my parents very much and, you know, they did their best, but they, like all Indigenous people, um, have inherited this legacy of colonialism and all of the things that it's done to our families and our communities. Um, And so, uh, yeah, it was... uh, my yeah my my childhood all those things were a little bit chaotic and um and i worked a lot growing up i i I, i've learned that working is uh or overworking or or being almost addicted to work is a form of it's a trauma response and it i see it in both my parents and i see it in myself and so much of my identity has been Um, sort of like centered on work and my career. And so I was just like, I guess from the time I, my whole life I've been, I've been kind of like a workaholic, Um, even in, you know, in elementary school, like I remember staying up till three in the morning to finish a project. You know, I was, I was always very committed to getting it done. (laughs) Um, And uh, I was also, I was diagnosed with ADHD not too long ago, which uh, made everything make a lot of sense. As someone who, you know, experienced trauma, someone with ADHD, all those things, having to sit with myself and not be able to work like everybody else or so many people during the pandemic, it was like a very illuminating time for so many reasons. It was very difficult to have to like sit in my shit (laughs) and kind of sit with my pain and sit with my history and kind of work through it. And yeah, kind of started to really think about what I actually wanted in life because I was so like 
just kind of one track mind, focused on work and very much in love with my work. Like I, I truly love what I do. It brings me a, you know, a deep sense of purpose, but I feel like um, the pandemic made me realize that I need to find like a deeper sense of purpose that isn't fully related to just my work and my career. And uh, so I, yeah, I, I wasn't really able to work for about a year, like a lot of people. And um, finally, when I went back on the road to work, um, I had, you know, this, this, after this time of sitting with my stuff and doing therapy and kind of just starting to think about, you know, what happiness means to me, um, I started to realize that I, I really needed to go home to my community here on the blood reserve. Um, it, in our language, it's, it's Ghana or Kainai. Um, and I needed to be with my family. I needed to be with my community. I had this kind of like really enlightening moment when I was on the road. Um, I was working on a documentary series called Thunder Bay and we made a pit stop at the Eagle Lake powwow, which is in Northern Ontario. And I've never seen a tarot card reader at a powwow before, but there was, <laughs> there was a tarot card reader at this powwow. And, um, at the time I was kind of like getting a little bit obsessed with astrology and, um, and, you know, tarot and all of that. So I sat down with this man and there was just something really like special about him, something that just felt a little bit otherworldly. And I think that we often feel that around people who are a little bit more like spiritually in touch. And, um, so he, he did a reading for me and he asked me, you know, he, he asked me a question that no one had ever really asked me before and a question I'd really never thought about. Um, and that was, what kind of elder do you want to be? And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be an elder someday. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? And what kind of life do I want when I am an elder? Um, because in our communities and in indigenous communities, elders are you know, some of our most prized community members, they're the people we value in every way and we, we treat them with the utmost respect. And, um, and so I thought about it and, and, and I thought about the future that I wanted and I realized that I wanted to be at home on the land in my community with a lot of happy grandchildren. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds like so simple, but also so far out of reach at that moment. Um, and so I just, I realized that I needed to start making some changes in my life. Um, one was leaving Vancouver um, and another was, was, you know, it resulted in the end of uh, the end of my marriage and, and we were meant to just not be together anymore anyway. And so, yeah, it's been a massive transition sort of joining the pandemic divorce club. <laughs> um, moving Is that on. really a thing? It is. It's a thing. You know what? I've realized there's so many people getting divorces and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. You know, I think life is too short to be in situations that sometimes just aren't meant to be. You know, I think um, we really need to value our happiness and we really need to value peace. And, you know, you can try and fix something, but if, if it, if it's, beyond repair, then it's time to move on and, and find peace alone. And so, yeah, I, I moved home and here I am in my community. I'm living at my mom's, which is kind of funny. It's like living with myself 25 years in the future. Um, and my grandmother lives right next door. So I go and see her every day, multiple times a day for coffee and just visit. And we have dinner together all the time. And, you know, it's it's honestly the most grounding thing to be here in my community with my family. It truly feels like I'm like, living a dream. And I'm so grateful that, you know, the pandemic was such a, and is such a difficult thing. And we've lost a lot of loved ones in this time. Everyone has experienced deep hardship, but I'm, I'm honestly grateful for that hardship because it puts so much into perspective. And I feel like I'm on the path I'm meant to be on right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. 
Talk to me a little bit about more about your your legacy. You talked about in in your personal life, and I heard you say that family obviously is a massive value, and it's that there obviously is a legacy in your culture as well, or cultures, which is inherent in you, right? That that you're honoring in your work, um, which is which is a beautiful thing. Talk to me about your legacy as an artist. I'm curious about that. Uh, wow, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, I guess I just I just kind of always revert back to not revert back to, but um, you know, think about my family and everything I do. Um, I think it's it's so remarkable that my community is is still here, that my people are still here, that our language is still alive, yeah. that our ceremonies are still alive. I think it's just so remarkable that my grandparents survived everything they did and that we're still here in one piece. I I just have the utmost respect and love for my family and my community. And so in terms of my work, everything that I create is in some ways honoring them and, and their legacy and just the fact that I'm I'm here because of them, you know, mm. I think it's it's really remarkable. And I've been, you know, I've had, I've made a lot of projects that are very kind of heavy, that are about difficult subject matter, that tell difficult stories. And those were really necessary projects. Those were very important films to make. And I think those were part of, of my legacy, whatever that is. But I'm kind of trying to transition into telling stories that offer a little bit more joy I think for my own sake and also for my community's sake. You know, when I when I make work, I think about audience. Like first I think about my family, I think about my grandparents. I lost my grandfather like uh 2 years ago and he's he was like a father to me. But I think about my my grandparents first and and wonder like what would they think of this and <laughs> are they going to be proud of me for making this? And and that's kind of usually the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also starting to think about my my nieces and my nephew and these beautiful little humans that are in my life. And how can I kind of like help build uh, a, a future that is a bit more hopeful and joyful for them? And how can I offer, how can I offer them stories that weren't available to me or accessible to me when I was a child? Um, because, you know, so often what we see the reflections of ourselves on screen, the representations we see of ourselves on screen, regardless of, of you know, what we know of ourselves, we still internalize what we see and as does the, the general public. And so I think it's really important to try and create stories that offer uh, representations that feel authentic and real and fun and empowering and all of those things that, that I think young people really need. So yeah, so I'm trying to kind of um, transition into telling some more stories that that are a bit more on the, the joyful side of of things. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's it's a really interesting, super interesting, and probably a totally longer conversation for me. I find it really fascinating the sort of arc of like you know, there's there's this incredible history and heritage that has been massively threatened, but survived, right? So there's mm -hmm. that element of we need to stick together and we need to remember, right? So that becomes a thing. And I get that. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. And it's it's interesting too, because, you know, you want to tell the stories so that, you know, it won't happen again, right? Um, again, which makes sense. And, but, but I'm hearing also that you're sort of saying, but there are so many joyous things that maybe we put to the sideline that we don't share because we're so busy trying to make sure everybody remembers. Does that resonate with you? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's this kind of like, um, pressure, uh, when you come from a marginalized community, when you come from communities that have been made vulnerable, that have experienced, you know, various forms of oppression, there's kind of this pressure to, tell stories of impact and meaning. And often that involves telling stories of hardship and survival. And those stories are very important, um, but it can be very difficult to be in the position of 
consistently having to tell stories like that or not necessarily having to but feeling the pressure of of, totally. of needing to put those stories into the world and um yeah it, i think the pandemic has also kind of offered that sort of insight for me in the sense that like sitting alone with this and reflecting on my work not only reflecting on my in my personal life and the trauma that i've experienced but reflecting on my work and just having to sit with these difficult stories and knowing the impact that they had on on me as a person and in turn the people around me mm -hmm. um i felt like all right maybe it's time to kind of like just try and think about the meaning of joy and the pursuit of joy and the ways that I can both offer that to myself and my family and my community, but also to, to my audience in, in the work that I create. Yeah. What I'm so curious, what things bring you joy, you personally? <laughs> you know, it's funny after, <laughs> after the divorce, that was like my, my soul, like pursuit <laughs> um, was like, what you know what is joy what does it mean to me and what are the things that that truly bring me joy and you know obviously first and foremost is family um and it's the land and being in my community and just spending time outside in this beautiful place that um offers me like the deepest sense of belonging um and music and dance and food and and friends and you know all of the the simple things that I think in my pursuit of like work and my career, I was kind of setting aside and like not making time for those sort mm. of very simple, but very important aspects of the human experience. So yeah, those things bring me a lot of joy and my dog, I have a res dog now. He kind of just walked into my, into my life one day and, and now he's, he's there every day. Um, yeah, you know, all those things bring me joy. And I've also thought a lot about, I've been in this, like, you know, thinking about joy and my own like personal pursuit of joy. I've thought about, um, how so many of our people, indigenous people who are stuck and tr like trapped in survival mode because of everything that they're up against and we're up against um, that sort of like privilege of the pursuit of joy or the privilege of being able to just feel peace um, and not be like trapped in that hamster wheel of oppression um, is, you know, it's taken from a lot of our people. And so I feel like, um, in terms of thinking about joy and my own pursuit of joy, that it needs to be also about like a, a communal um, and more like lateral sense of joy in that, like, how can I, how can I support my community? How can I support my family? How can I be part of building more joy in those around me, not just myself? Cause I think, you know, there's this very like Western individualistic, idea of like self-care and of joy and peace and whatever that means. Um, and it's, it, it is very like counterintuitive and doesn't really run parallel with, with, with community and, and building community and, um, and also just the ways that I was raised within community, you know, it's, it's about how can we lift each other up? How can we bring each other joy? Um, how can we make sure that our our family and our neighbors and our friends are are doing okay, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. And it's so interesting because I never really myself think of joy. I, I believe that we all have access to joy no matter where, that it's within us. It's not like a transactional thing. Mm -hmm. And it, and what also really stands out to me is that maybe you don't see it, so I'm just going to point it out, but with with all this this community that you're upholding and that you're you know that is that is your value there's so much joy in that <laughs> like from my perspective right you you have something worth protecting that brings you joy do you know what i mean like it's already there yeah yeah absolutely and it's that it's joyous to see what are three adjectives that you might use to describe yourself three adjectives to describe myself uh 
gosh, I don't know. Um, I'm a little bit restless. I, I, I don't know how to sit still. I'm always on the go. Maybe that's an ADHD thing. Maybe it's a trauma thing. Maybe it's just a me thing. Um, you know, I come from two people who never sit still. Um, both of my parents are very, um, my father uh, is involved in politics, in Sami politics. He was an activist and very involved in the Sami rights movement. And he lives in his home village over in Norway. And my mother is a physician here at home on the blood reserve. And they're both very involved in community, very involved in, um, you know, working tirelessly just to try and make things better for their respective communities, both of which I belong to. Um, so I think the restlessness comes from from them and uh was i don't know another i i am I'm, I'm a very social person i i really love people i love meeting people i love learning about people and i love just hearing people's stories everybody has a story i think that's why i you know I'm a storyteller as i just i love i love people i love learning from people i love learning about people i'm fascinated by the human experience and the capacity to to you know overcome so much and the capacity that we have as humans to feel joy in the face of hardship i i don't know is social an adjective <laughs> would that be the right adjective sure. i don't know um what's another one uh i guess i um I like, I like to laugh. I really like to have fun. I really like to, you know, a lot of my work is serious and intense, but um, I really do enjoy fun and laughter. And oh, no. um, I think we need to make space for that all the time. Mm. Mm. I love it. Can I point something out? Just that I sure. observed. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's really interesting. Two things that stood out to me, and maybe, maybe this tells me something about you. But I'll just play it back because it'll be interesting to you. Not for nothing. Um, one one thing that I observed was that you always tied it to a reason. Well, first of all, it was difficult for you, which is interesting to me to 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 talk about yourself. So you tied it to actually went into quite a long explanation of where it came from, and then I learned a lot about your mom and dad when I asked <laughs> when I asked about you. So that's super interesting to me, and I just point that out. And then. Yeah, I think the other thing is is to like the analysis, right? The analysis of is that a word? You know, maybe it's because is it right? Like it was, yeah, it's so interesting to me. What do you think about that? <laughs> uh it makes sense. I think that's how I approach everything in <laughs> life. Is uh I I I love to learn. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always trying to learn about new things and people and experiences and um I think that involves a lot of critical thinking and reasoning and um, yeah. So that makes sense. (laughs) That's cool. Why do you think, why do you suppose it was a little bit tricky to, to come up with something quickly about yourself? What was the challenge for you? Um, I, well, to be honest, I'm really uncomfortable talking about myself. I think, I think a lot of people are when it comes to like, really like, core qualities of who we are as people it's kind of a I think it's yeah I think it makes me uncomfortable to talk about talk about myself it could be a cultural thing too you know it's not very like um yeah we uh you know the way (laughs) sorry I'm I'm not laughing at you but in my head I'm going yes yes doctor of the health feathers analysis (laughs) I think I'm doing it again there we go (laughs) Oh my god! No, no, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Do you ever get? Do you ever get paralysis by analysis? <laughs> Definitely, all yeah. the time. <laughs> all Jeez. the time. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that usually because you get so caught in the analysis, or is it because because there's kind of different flavors of that, right? Some people it could be just they can't they can't move forward because they're just analyzing everything, and some people it's because everything seems so good. And so there's like a fairness, you know, kind of criteria of like, well, to be fair, that would be amazing. And talk to me about which, how that shows up for you, the, uh, the paralysis. Um, I think I just, um, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I just, uh, I guess I just get lost in thought, you know, I, it's, uh, (laughs) 
It's just, I've, I guess I've always been a thinker and a daydreamer and also just, I just really love to understand the reason why behind everything, you know, yeah. I think if we can, if we can, uh, if we can find the reason why behind things, it, it makes everything make a lot more sense, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, in, in, in every way, but also I think sometimes we don't need to know the reason why for everything. Um, maybe that's just like a natural human response as well as to kind of find the reason why um, so that we can yeah, put yeah, something I mean, active yeah. or mm-hmm. make sense of tragedy or make sense of trauma or, you know, make sense of these, these horrible things that, that we experience sometimes or that others experience or the things we witness in the news, you know? So I think there's this like natural human response of, of, of trying to find logic and trying to find reason to make uh, sense. Yeah. 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 Yep. What about curiosity? How does curiosity differ from that? How can you differentiate the two? Uh, yeah, I think curiosity is, 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 uh, I think I'm, I'm more curious than I am needing to find reasoning for everything. Yeah. Um, uh, cause you know, I think curiosity opens up so many doors, you know, and curiosity yeah. keeps us humble. Mm-hmm. And curiosity uh, opens us up to possibility, you know, and I, I really love the fact that this life that we live is is full of infinite possibility. And I think hardship can teach us that as well. It's such a cheesy thing to say that, you know, when one door closes, it closes, another one opens, but it is true. You know, it's like, there's, there's so many possibilities in this life and we have so many choices and, you know, sometimes we um, don't have control over, over the things that are the barriers that are placed in front of us. Um, I think it's important to recognize privilege and power and those types of things. But yeah, I think curiosity keeps us humble and curiosity reminds us that there's like infinite possibility in this, in this lifetime. And that we are just little tiny creatures in this massive universe, you know? Hell yeah. No, absolutely. I love it. So curiosity is ranking real high there as one of your, <laughs> how you would describe yourself. I love that. How would, how would others acquaintances, let's say people that know you, how would, what, what adjectives would they use for you? Oh God, I don't know. Uh, that's a really tough one too. <laughs> Um, I'm a little bit scattered and flaky, but also very committed and passionate. Maybe those are things people would say about me. That's so cool. It's so interesting. You know, I can't help but think about your character in in Three Pines. And it's really interesting because what you just described is like the opposite of her, right? Like she's so focused. Yeah. Yeah. She's a cop. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. How was it? How was it playing? Like, cause you know, sometimes we, we take pieces of ourselves, right. When we're, when we're portraying a character and, and so on and so forth, what did you tap into to, to, to play that role? Um, well, first of all, it was really challenging to even accept the role because it meant playing a police officer. And, you know, I, I thoroughly believe that we need to defund the police and put a whole lot of money into, other support systems for people who are struggling and also just put money into community, you know, Um, and the police have a very violent history with indigenous people, with black people, with marginalized communities, with people who live with addictions, with people who are in poverty, with people who are homeless. And, you know, policing is not going to solve these problems. Policing only exacerbates the problem, in in my opinion. That being said, there are, you know, a lot of Indigenous police officers in this world, and, and they do believe, I think, in, in many of many of the police officers I've spoken to um, through my work pre- prior to Three Pines, they did it because they believe they could make change from the inside, and I fully understand that, that reasoning and, and that motivation. And I think with Isabel Lacoste, my character on Three Pines, um, it 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 is that it's it's this idea that you know she's 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 pursuing goodness and she's pursuing trying to make change from the inside. Um, and 
I, I think the writers on that show did a really great job of just of, of of showing that it's it's an uphill battle. It's like a hamster wheel that you 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 can't really change something that is inherently uh, broken, something that is not working. You know, I think we need to imagine completely new alternatives um, to to the current structures of of policing and, and criminalizing poverty and, and people who live with addictions. And um, I obviously think that we can't just like get rid of the police tomorrow, but we can um, certainly work towards making massive changes in, in the way that we 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 deal with the um, the social ills in our society. Um, yeah. Yeah, so playing her was difficult for for those reasons, for, mm. you know, moral ethical reason, but also it was really interesting to me to like get into the mind of this person who, um, you know, was taken during the '60s scoop, uh, was raised by a non-indigenous family, was disconnected from her community, and uh, wanted to, you know, be part of a uh, you know, positive change within her world. And so that was all kind of really fascinating. And I think the writing was great. And it was just like um, a really wonderful opportunity to be part of something that put these difficult stories of Indigenous experience and Indigenous reality on a global stage. So that was kind of like, ultimately why I decided to do it was because I recognized that this was an opportunity to be part of something that would share our stories on a on a global level like it it had a huge reach you know people were watching it all over the world and that was very remarkable and it was also really remarkable to be the the lead woman on screen on this massive show and be an indigenous woman playing you know this i guess for lack of a better term a, a role model you know she was she's someone who has her her shit together and she's strong and independent and she's a loving mother and she's you know she's flawed and and she's figuring her way out of 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 the darkness and you know she's she's just a really interesting person and the fact that that was an indigenous woman on screen on this like massive global scale was really was really remarkable yeah, no, truly. It truly was. That seems like a really interesting space um, where all your worlds ca came together, I'm guessing, in that, mm -hmm. you know, it was probably, I don't know, it, would you would you consider that one of your sort of biggest roles so far in your career as an actress? Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, so there's that call. And it came, did, did the opportunity come during the pandemic? It did. Yeah, it kind of, it, um, it came... Uh, while I was working on uh, the the Thunder Bay documentary series, so I, you know, I I I would say that I direct most of the time. That's that's mostly my job, <laughs> um, and usually once a year I'll do some acting gig that uh, you know brings me um, fun and and uh, you know a different kind of like creative fulfillment, and yeah, and that that it happened to be three pines i um i worked on a film called stellar and was directing this documentary series called thunder bay and then this this three pines opportunity came up and six days after my call back i was in montreal getting ready to shoot the show and and i lived in montreal for five months and um yeah it was a very wild experience um Alfred Molina is such a kind person and mm -hmm. is just so down to earth and so real um, and just very generous as an actor. And so it was really like so uh, mind blowing to like be <laughs> working with Alfred Molina, someone who I'd watched on screen like my whole life essentially. And then the the rest of the cast was incredible you know tantu cardinal she's she's an icon um my friend ross of sutherland i just love working with that person i love him so much um and yeah i got to watch tracy deer this mohawk director uh woman direct episodes three and four and just to see an indigenous woman directing a series of that scale with this massive budget and this huge crew just a massive undertaking and just to see her own it and to like be in control and and um you know 
really truly be on top of her on her on top of her game and her craft as a as a filmmaker was just so inspiring and I felt really safe and supported in that environment and also Sam Donovan was just a fantastic director uh, to work with he did eps one two seven and eight and um, he was very generous and knew that I was also a filmmaker and um, so I was, you know, lucky enough to be able to learn from, from him as well. And that's often one of the reasons why I'll take an acting role is, is, um, it's solely based on who the director is. And, um, I always take those opportunities as, as chances to learn and just to sort of be a sponge and watch how a director works and see how they make decisions, how they communicate with their, their cast and their crew. Because communication is, is key. I think in order to be a, you know, a good director, you have to be able to communicate with people in a respectful and meaningful and generous way. And so, yeah, all of it was, was, was a wildly thrilling and great learning opportunity for me. What's your definition of living in the moment? What is my definition of living in the moment? Yeah. Um, joy. <laughs> I know it sounds so cheesy, but um, I had this, just this realization and, you know, all this thinking about what does joy mean and what does it mean to, to chase your joy? Um, it, 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 it is the most like, it is the most present emotion we can feel, which is joy, you know. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll tell a story about Ross of Sutherland. We were working on Three Pines and, you know, often we would end up in the same transport vehicles home from St. Armand, which is the town that became Three Pines, uh, back into Montreal. And we had a lot of long talks and um, he's a very, you know, he he thinks in in very unconventional ways. He's, he's a lovely human and, and mm. I'm so grateful. He's my friend. But I think he recognized that I was I was very unhappy at the time that we we were working on Three Pines. You know, my marriage was kind of fully falling apart. I'd 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 left Vancouver and um, I was you know I was in a I was in a, a sad place. I was grieving the loss of something um, that I was I was grieving the loss of a future that I'd kind of like been very set on and and I you know we started talking about what I wanted in life and. Um, I told him, I, you know, I just, I just want to move home. I just want to be home in my community with my family. And, and he said, you know, chase your joy. And it sounded, it was such a simple thing, but I'd never heard anyone say that directly to me in, in, in a moment when I, I truly needed it. Um, and so, yeah, I started to, you know, think about really chasing my joy on a deeper level, not just because of Rasa. <laughs> going to credit him with all of that, but, but he definitely helped sort of, um, plant that, that little seed of, of, of thinking about this concept of chasing joy. But later on, I went and worked on, on a show called Little Bird. Uh, I, I directed the first three episodes of a show called Little Bird, and it's about the 60s scoop, which it, for maybe for American listeners, it's uh, the 60s scoop was a was the systemic removal of indigenous children from our families and communities. And um, they were placed in foster care, adopted by non-indigenous families. It's a process that's still ongoing. There's the millennium scoop. Um, and, you know, today, indigenous children make up the vast majority of children in foster care in Canada. So it's it's a problem and and it needs to change. And there are many people in our communities who are advocating for change and have been for a long time. And so this the the show, uh, Little Bird is about the 60s scoop. And so I went and worked on the show and you know it was very heavy, but it was a really wonderful experience in that I was surrounded by other Indigenous people wanting to tell a really important story and really making sure that we were taking care of each other and that we were making space for joy. Um, and it was a very healing experience. Um, and, you know, I was going through all of this intense stuff in my personal life and um, was really trying to like hold on to joy and, and, and chase it and find it in, in the smallest ways. And anyway, at the end of that journey, I ended up, you know, um, falling in love. I found, I found someone new and I fell in love, um, after the show finished. And this person and I, we laugh a lot. There's a lot of, of joy, a lot of laughter in our relationship and, um, and, 
I started just to think more deeply about, you know, the meaning of laughter and, and the, the way that laughter is medicine. And I started to think about mindfulness and um, what it means to be present in the moment, what mindfulness means um, on a very like simple, obvious level. And honestly, when I'm laughing, when I'm feeling joy with my family, with my partner, with my coworkers, with my friends, I'm able to forget about my pain. I'm able to not think about my worries in the future. I'm able to just exist in that moment and feel joy. And it's honestly the most wonderful feeling to laugh and, and to share laughter with others and to, to feel, yeah, a deep sense of like presence and, and being in the moment and, and feeling like truly alive because it's, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. So yeah, that's a very roundabout way of answering that question. Um, but I think, yeah, to me, joy is, is the most present um, in the moment feeling we can, we can have for, yeah. for all of those reasons. Yeah, no, it's totally on point, actually. I mean, it's really on point. And it is true, actually, when you're when you're laughing or in hysterics or in any of these kind of euphoric, spontaneous, physical experiences, you are actually scientifically in the moment. If you yeah. want, if you want data, I mean, you know what I mean, let alone. Yeah. And if you can bring awareness to how that feels like you are right, it's it's, it's, a, it's a gift. And it's it's available to us, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think about my community, I think about other indigenous communities and, and communities that have experienced like so much hardship. When you spend time in these spaces with, with your people, when I'm with my people, there's so much laughter, Mm. you know, and, and it's, it, 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 I have this like deep sense of belonging and, and a sense of like, oh, I'm at home when I hear my people laughing. And it's like, it's one of the most beautiful things. And I think the fact that we're able to laugh, that we're able to feel joy and presence and connection is a really radical and profound thing. Um, Because, you know, we've been through so much, all of us carry a, you know, deep sense of trauma because of everything we've been through. Um, And the fact that we can feel joy in the face of all of that is, is extraordinary. And, um, yeah, it gives me a, a deep sense of pride. So it's, yeah, it's all of those things. And it's, a, you know, I, I really think we need to constantly make space for joy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think making space is key. I love the way you describe that because again, it's available to us, but we have to, we have to make the space. We have to open mm-hmm. up to it. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have experienced joy with you today. I mean, I, I feel, I feel we've experienced some joy. We've created some together just mm-hmm. by trust and by, you know, being in the moment. And, and I thank you for that. I think I'm in gratitude for that. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking me all of these really deep questions about myself and the human experience. And yeah, um, well, that's what I love to do. In the film and television industry, we're just so used to doing interviews where we're Ask the, ask the same old questions. Oh my God. Yeah. It's nice to talk about, uh, you know, real life stuff and the human experience. And I'm, I'm very kind of like, that's very much my, my path right now is just thinking about, you know, the human experience and, and life and all of that. Maybe it's because I'm almost 38 and the biological clock is ticking. (laughs) (laughs) You're so funny. Let me ask you just a couple more official questions and then, and then I'll say goodbye to you. Listen, again, it's been amazing. What do you know will stay true about you no matter what happens? I, I know that I'm always going to be proud of where I come from and who I come from and that no matter what, I will always be connected to this place. And um, yeah. Yeah. That was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. What would you say is your Achilles heel? Uh, my Achilles heel. Um, I think, you know, self-doubt and like imposter syndrome and, um, you know, it, it exists for a lot of reasons. I've, uh, you know, I'm an indigenous woman working in a space that is not, not very it's it's kind of hostile in some ways towards towards me and my my people and my lived experience and the way that I work and um so I've kind of always had to do things my own way and also with community and so 
yeah, I think there's a lot of self doubt and, and this industry is, is a very tough one to be in. You have to grow a lot of thick skin, you know, for instance, I haven't, I haven't booked an acting gig since three pines and I wrapped a year and a half ago, almost. I've been doing a lot of directing, but yeah, you have to kind of just grow thick skin and know that, um, it's, it's the industry and that, you know, my, my self-worth has to be built on something a lot deeper than, than my job and whether or not I'm going to be doing another (laughs) acting gig. Um, and yeah. And then, you know, imposter syndrome, I think, um, again, as an indigenous woman, as someone who has ADHD, um, that's something that's like very common with, as I've learned with other ADHDers is that, um, there's a yeah deep sense of kind of imposter syndrome and a sense of like not belonging and not being good enough or not having um, the talent or skill to to necessarily be where we are. But I know that it it that that is not truth. That it's that it's it's part of this like negative self talk. And so yeah, I would say those are those are my kind of Achilles yeah. heels. Just being too hard on myself um, and being to, uh, and, and yeah, letting self doubt creep in. I think it's an easy thing to do. I'm, I'm really fascinated by neuroplasticity and cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've been doing this for years, uh, just thinking of cognitive behavioral therapy and, and mindfulness. I've been practicing it for almost like 10 years. And it's really incredible to see the ways that I've been able to change the way I think and the way I react and respond to difficult situations Mm -hmm. and the way that I can change, you know, my own behaviors and habits um, just by being aware of my thoughts, being aware of where they come from, being aware of my history, my legacy, my own trauma, the ways that my trauma informs my reactions to the world. Um, And, uh, yeah, I'm yeah fascinated by neuroplasticity and the capacity to change the way we can think and the way we feel and the way we can uh, relate to the world totally. around us. And so I think it's so easy to fall into that pattern of self-doubt, of negative self-talk, of just beating ourselves up and being hard on ourselves and and also like giving in to you know as an indigenous woman, as also as a queer person, giving into these ideas that I don't belong in these spaces because some straight white man told me I don't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So um, I think that it's also important just to like be proud of who we are and, and be kind to ourselves and, and really just try and eliminate those patterns of, of negative self-talk. Totally. Let's do this. Okay. I'm going to say a word and you are just going to say whatever comes to your mind so you don't have to think. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm going to think about it, like, way too That's far. okay. You can think if you want to. Terrible <laughs> rapid fire. It doesn't have to be rapid if you don't. Never, it never actually <laughs> is. All right. So what makes you hungry? Food. <laughs> I'm always hungry. I'm You're always hungry. I love awesome. food. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what makes you joyful? food <laughs> love it what makes you sad <laughs> not having food <laughs> perfect okay we're I'm on a roll here what, what inspires you uh when my, my family or just my family my community indigenous yeah. youth just yeah. people doing great things yep what frustrates you uh when people are unkind mm. you know I think we have a choice in this world we can be kind or we could not be kind. Yeah. It's just when people are rude, when people are unkind and just like, don't recognize that we're all just human beings. You know, I, I live in Southern Alberta. It's a very racist place. It's a place that's very hostile towards indigenous people. And it's like, this is our homeland. This is our territory. And to feel unwelcome in our own territory is an awful feeling. Um, And so, yeah, I experience it in a different way because often, you know, people don't necessarily know that I'm Indigenous. I'm kind of ethnically ambiguous, so I experience racism differently, but then also I am coded as Indigenous a lot of the time. So, you know, I go across the street to the town and I'll get followed around stores Mm. and 
only recently now that people know I'm in this show called Three Pines, it's a little bit different now that they treat me a little bit differently. But, but yeah, I still get followed around stores. I still get treated like I'm going to steal something. So that, yeah, that makes me angry is, is racism, obviously. Yeah. And just a general lack of like humanity and, and dignity that you know, a lot of uh, people sort of carry. Yeah, 100%. What well, makes you laugh? Oh, makes me laugh. My grandma makes me laugh all the time, every day. <laughs> I hang out with her every. She, my grandma's like my best friend. I literally um, hang out with her more than most people. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! How old is um, she? Yeah, my grandma Virginia. She's eighty three. Oh. Uh, she drove a school bus for f- over forty years here on the reserve. She was also a nurse at the Indian Hospital. I don't. I don't know if people know this, but for a long time there were Indian hospitals, uh, which were separate from regular old Canadian we called here in, in this part of the world white hospitals so yeah she was a she was a nurse and she's really funny she's she's been through a lot and she's really really funny I bet she was the children's favorite bus driver did they love her <laughs> it's so funny because <laughs> she's she'll see people like she'll see people like in their 40s or 50s and they'll be like hey bus driver <laughs> you know and it's like oh it's so nice to know that you know she's people still remember her as as their bus driver and that she was this sweet little lady. Love it. Oh, that's so awesome. And finally, what are you most grateful for? I feel like I just like always say family, but I am. I'm like super that's grateful okay. for my family. I'm grateful for my family and everything that they've done for for me and for us and for my community. Yeah. What are the top three things that have happened so far today? Mm, I... <laughs> Took my dog out for a walk. Yeah. He, uh, madly dug a, into a gopher hole. He's like currently obsessed with finding gophers. Uh, so it was like, yeah, really nice to step outside and see that spring is finally here. It feels like this winter's just like dragged on forever. Yeah. And just having coffee with my mom was really nice. And um, this conversation has been really lovely. Mm, love it. And what is what is something that you're looking forward to both today and then in the future? Um, I'm going to go have lunch with two friends from high school in Lethbridge at this delicious restaurant called Umami. If you're ever in Lethbridge, Alberta, go to Umami. It's very, very good food. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Longer term. uh, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to summer. I'm looking forward to just sunny days and hiking and getting outside with my dog and my family and my friends and my partner and traveling and, um, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Listen, thank you so much for, I've had so much fun talking to you and learning about you. It's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you. It was a really great conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's my pleasure. I have been speaking today with L- Ellie. L- oh, fuck. <laughs> Just call me Maya. It's no, fine. I want to say it right. <laughs> Ella Maya. Ella Maya. Ella. Ella. Maya. Maya. Yeah, Ella Maya. Ella Maya. Tail feathers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. And remember to live in the moment. In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.